right? So you mentioned creativity in the book also. Uh, it was fascinating to learn creativity is uh, optimized at the same decibel level of the average coffee shop. I think uh, many of us can attest uh, that a dull gray cube leads to dull gray thinking, as you say in the book. Can you expand on that? Uh, yes, it's very interesting. Um, when we uh, most think about this in a business setting. When you're in a business setting building a presentation, what you're going to typically often do is whatever computer or laptop you're using, you kind of open it up and you open up PowerPoint and you start adding titles and adding bullets. I mean, that's a horrible thing to do. A, PowerPoint isn't asking you any of the questions that are required in the creative process. There's nothing wrong with PowerPoint, by the way, as a delivery tool for visuals, but that's really all it is. Just a tool. And we're all, we all yes. succumb to the, to but, the lure of yeah. tools. We do. We, but the problem is we use it as a tool for design, but it's a tool for delivery. A design tool is, has to ask you certain questions. Who is my audience? What do they know? What do they believe? What do they care about? What do they need to know? What do they need to believe in order to take the action I want them to take? And so the first thing, if I back up and say that, that the process of design is not the process of build. Yeah, so Tim, Tim, if we can, if you can highlight too, because this is a really important point that for me to even understand as well was uh, design versus delivery. Can you touch on that as well? Yes. So um, most people, when they think about uh, communication, they think about how well they communicate or present. They almost immediately default to the quality of their delivery. You know, am I am I nervous? Do I have good eye contact and body language and so on and so forth? Uh, we probably don't have time to go into it, but but you can have the most polished, sparkling delivery in the world. But if you have a single major brain violation in your design, you'll be totally ineffective. There's a, you may remember the prologue in the book describes the CEO, true story again, mm -hmm. literally world-class, sparkling delivery. But his topic was these 10 things we've got to get right this year. And, and going back to what I said earlier about not remembering a guy's name when you're introduced to him because there's no context, he presented 10 independent ideas. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. There's no narrative within them. And what happened was I grabbed a guy after the session. I mean, people were gooey-eyed over this guy. I mean, literally, like, this is the most amazing communicator I've ever seen. And at the end, I simply grabbed a guy in the audience and I said, uh, uh, and I'd spoken earlier in the day, so he was happy to talk to me. And I said, you know, Adolfo, um, tell me, great guy, right? What do you remember from this presentation? I mean, two minutes later, he remembered two things. Yeah. 20% retention rate. His CEO saying these are the most important things we've got to do this year. And within two minutes, he had 20% retention, 80% uh, uh, lost information, which is very Guil typical. Yeah. Guilty as charged. Now, what happened there? What happened there? is you see that it isn't about delivery that you've got to get right. You've got to get design and architecture right, which is all about creating an argument that maps to the way the brain works. Now, delivery, you want it to be solid, but it doesn't need to be spectacular. The greatest communicators I've seen, some of the greatest, have really average delivery, but the quality of the, the architecture and construction of their ideas was so good. So take that back to PowerPoint. There's nothing wrong with PowerPoint. It is a tool for delivering visuals, but that's all it is. The guy that designed PowerPoint has written extensively on this. He said our task was to replace overhead projectors. It's a delivery tool. It doesn't ask you the design questions you need to ask. If, if you don't back up to the, the design question, say, okay, uh, what are my big ideas? That's probably the most important question. Actually, probably the most important question is, what do I want my audience to do? The second most important question is, what do they need to believe in order to do that? And those, the answer to that question is where your big ideas come from. A big idea in any communication is the thing you need your audience to believe in order to take the action you want them to take. And PowerPoint doesn't ask you those questions. So what you, you need to do is have a process, and the book gives it to you, and as you know, actually, from having the book, you have access to our software tool Mm -hmm. which is the only message architecture tool in existence. It's not PowerPoint. It doesn't compete with PowerPoint. It's a tool that walks you through the architectural questions of defining your big ideas and how you're going to support them. Now, to the very first part of your question, that the create, there is creativity embedded in that process, and it is generally true that there are certain things you can do to your brain or with your brain to 
increase its, its creativity quotient. Um, uh, for example, uh, you're right. Uh, the decibel level of a coffee shop, I think it's, I can't remember what it is, 70 decibels, something like that, is actually proven to, to optimize creativity. You work better in that kind of buzzy Italian restaurant environment than in sure. a library. The other thing also, you'll find this very interesting, is visual clues and visual variety. Do you know where I find myself most creative when I really need to be creative? It'd be in a zoo. Hmm. I like That's the right. visual system of a zoo or, or an art gallery. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my, my favorite writer by far, if you, if you don't like my book, read the, a book called The Art of Travel by Alain de Botton. He's a British, okay. uh, actually of Swiss descent, he's a British uh, philosopher. We'll add that to the and show he, notes, everyone. Okay. He's great. And his book talks, in, in one, this book called The Art of Travel, talks about why we travel. And he says one of the things about travel is it optimizes creativity. And he says, if you imagine being on a train and all of these new, especially if you're in another country, all of these interesting sites and, you know, why is that church that shape? Why is that roof that color? Why is the pitch of that roof that shape? And what he says is it, it stiggers, it, uh, stiggers, sorry, it triggers or stimulates new synaptic connections in the brain. He uses a, a line I quote in the book, which I adore. He said, you may not have got to this, I don't know, journeys are the midwives of I thought. Did. Yeah. Oh, that's an amazing. That's very interesting. When I read that, yeah, that resonated. That stuck. Uh -huh. oh, journeys of the midwives of thought. So it, it's literally true that if you want to be creative, go for a walk, go to an art gallery, walk around, go to a zoo, and you will be more creative generally. It's also a helpful way of being creative when you design communication. And that that idea of you know a dull gray cube leads to dull gray thinking. By the way, antithetical idea. A thing leads to another thing. Right. It does tend to be true. You, you're not going to optimize creativity looking at the same gray walls you've always looked at. You can't do it all the time, but uh, you know our software will sit on your iPad, the, the message architect, and we encourage people, go to a coffee shop, go to a zoo, and architect that presentational message in an environment where creativity is more optimized.